Right then guys, welcome back to 10 Minute Tea episode 3. And I have got Yorkshire Gold today. Uh, I have already done a kind of taste test sort of last, well, no not last week now, a week before. Um, so this isn't my first taste test of Yorkshire Tea, hence why there was no big, wow that's nice or anything like that. Um, to be honest, I did the taste test, I said <coughs> in one of, <coughs> oh yeah, <coughs> I should also say before starting this video, I've got COVID, so if I'm coughing throughout this video, you know why. I'm still trying to keep going, you can see it's not really, it, it has affected me quite a lot, and it is affecting me, but I'm, I'm still trying to keep going anyway, so I'm trying to just roll through if I can. Um... So yeah, uh, that's the first thing I should mention. But yeah, so I tried this uh, Yorkshire Tea Gold the other week and um, I did say in one of the videos that basically I didn't really feel like it could be any different or any better and that was my first opinion of it when I tried it. I tried it around my friend's house and uh, I basically bought brought some back in a little bag from Banger because obviously I bought it in Banger and I... Uh, yeah, I just thought, well, you know, it's okay, but there's not really that much difference. And to be honest, they're, they're like charging, I don't know, two pound or, or a pound extra for the pack. And I think, really, if there's not that much difference, do they, do they really want to be charging that extra? But anyway, it might just be me. It might be where I am because I know there's differences in the, in the water. Uh, like you can get some areas with hard water and then... I assume other areas, they call it soft water, I, I don't know exactly. But yeah, so um, this is York Tea Gold, and I will, once I've, once I've drank a little bit more of it today, I'll give you a bit more of a, a better opinion. Because it's nice, it is nice, but I just can't really see the the big difference between that and then just ordinary Yorkshire Tea, it doesn't really cut it for me there's not really much of a distinction but yeah so uh the thing i'm going to talk about today obviously i was going to uh do the third episode on dreams and i was going to talk uh, a little bit about dreams and stuff like that but uh last week i was in cyprus and basically uh, i wanted to talk about that a little bit i wanted to touch upon that uh it was a very last minute thing I knew I was going to be doing it, but uh, I didn't know exactly the dynamics and when and, you know, travel arrangements, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then six days, maybe seven days before, uh, we were planning it, we were booking it, and then we were going. So it was very, very quick. Um, but because, you know, obviously I'd done that, I thought that makes a nice little topic for this episode of, of 10 Minute Tea. I was going to record, and in fact I did practically record an episode of 10 Minute Tea while in Cyprus, but in the room, there's three of us in the room, people were coming and going out of the room at the time, it didn't really make the best episode, so I thought, you know what I'll do, I'll do an episode when I'm back, and what I can do as well is put in uh, the videos and stuff from, from when I was away, so that will make it uh, a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more um uh, easy to produce as well here while i'm here so um yeah so i will be throughout the video i'll put up uh sort of ma mainly portrait style videos um because that's what i got on my phone of uh various things we did in cyprus um obviously well actually i've, I've still got my uh I don't know where you see it there, I've still got my all-inclusive band on. We went on an all-inclusive, what you could semi-call a lad's holiday in a sense. I went with uh, two of my friends that I've known for many, many years. Um, and I had suggested uh, going on a lively holiday somewhere. So uh, that's what we did. Uh, it was very, very nice. I think what, what I should do is, before I go into it and start rambling on various different things, as I, I normally do, uh, I'll, I'll sort of go from day one onwards and, and talk about it that way and, and try and be somewhat succinct as well. So, uh, day one, of course, was, was travelling and, and just going out there. Of course, it was my first time on a plane in eight years 
and I was uh, somewhat nervous about that. I wasn't too certain on how it would go. Um, and uh, we went through the airport and we had some pretty bad queues actually at Manchester Airport. Um, but it wasn't, you know, at the end of the day, we got through and it wasn't too bad. Uh, you know, speaking sort of overall, shall we say. Um, and then we get on the plane and, of course, take off landing. You know, there's a little bit of nerves there for me. Um, certainly, it, it wasn't the case that I was just sat there perfectly serene or anything like that. There was some nerves there. Um, but when I was up in the air, remarkably, I was pretty damn calm. I was really in a state of... Uh, it was just a nice state of kind of, uh, I don't know, just, just rela relaxation is the only way to describe it, really. I was quite relaxed and I was surprised at that because I thought maybe I'd be uh, a little bit more anxious generally for the entire flight, but that wasn't the case. Um, and the flight was all right. We had lovely, uh, uh, we were in a different plane than we should have been in. We have, had lovely seats. We had a little bit more leg room. We had lovely um what do we call them sort of inbuilt uh screens on on the on the seat sort of tablet screens on the seat really really nice plane anyway we get there it's late and we just have tea and and that's about it for that first day really what i will say is really lovely food there um really you know we, we had a good variety of things there not as nice as let's say some of the places i've been in the past especially sort of in childhood or teenage years um, there, uh, you know, in some, uh, hotels that I'd been to, the food was, uh, really, really good. Uh, this one, well, I would say it was good, but it wasn't like really, really top, you know, like 10 out of 10 kind of thing. The variety was certainly good. Um, the quality was, I would say good, but not at that top level, if, if you know what I mean. So, um, but but it was nice and uh, I enjoyed getting it every night and I looked forward to it. So that's always a, a brilliant sign uh, that something something's what you want, really. Um, so the next day, obviously, uh, got up, had breakfast and stuff. Uh, and uh, I think it was more of like a, a bit of a pool day. We might have gone somewhere on that next day. Might have been either that day or the day after that we went to this beach. Um, in fact, it was the day after we went to this beach that day i think was more of a pool day then in the evening we went out clubbing so again i'll, I'll probably have put some pictures here already but i'll put a, a video or so of us going clubbing um hopefully i'll get it from the right night as well so that then it, it you know it's in chronological order uh, that'd be quite cool so um uh yeah so we went clubbing that night uh that was uh, i'm trying to think which which night that was, where where that was, which club that was. We went to a club called Encore first for like 10 minutes, just walked in, had a look around and then walked out again. Uh, there was another club we went in for uh, a smaller amount of time. We went in for the main part, it was a club called the Castle Club. Now, the Strip, obviously we were in Ayanapa in Cyprus, the strip in Ayanapa is mental. It's out of this world. You've got tons and tons of clubs, probably 40 or 50 clubs. It feels like it, maybe not that quite that amount, but it feels like that. When you're walking through, it's just club after club after club after club. It is crazy. Um, and it is quite a long strip and you follow it right round. Um, but we went in this club called the Castle Club. We had a... I, I was sort of partially feeling it at the start and then I got into it and uh, we were real. And then by the end of it, it was brilliant. We were loving it and it was... Uh, I was dancing like crazy and it was all going off and everything. There was some great tunes on. Was some, it wasn't just your modern stuff, although I say that, you know, some of the stuff that I'm going to say is quite modern anyway, but... Uh, you know, there was things like Black Eyed Peas in there and stuff like that. And I think there was a few slightly older rappers in there and stuff. Uh, maybe early 2000s, something like that. Uh, not, let's say, just your 2020 stuff or your 2018, 2019 stuff. There was some stuff that, uh, let's say, growing up as a kid, I was more familiar with. Even though that wasn't necessarily a long time ago. Um, but yeah, so it was absolutely brilliant. 
um, and uh, there was loads of people there, girls, guys, <coughs> all having a good time, um, all, you know, uh, a remarkable percentage of the people there were, were very attractive, obviously young people, uh, really enjoying themselves, everything going on, you know, it was the hub of life, shall we say. Um, of course, you know, as uh, coming from the angle of, of a psychologist or particularly of someone of the Jungian persuasion, you always end up getting these ideas of, well, there's a lot of crowd psychology here, there's a lot of kind of like this bleeding into a, um, a psychological oneness that then uh, dissolves any sense of individuality and stuff like that. But to be honest, you can be in an environment like that, in an environment that's very, very, uh, you know, crowd psychological, shall we say, yet you can still keep your individuality and you can still keep your head. And there's even a, a remarkable argument for, for actually uh, at times dissolving into that and, and enjoying that experience for what it what, what it is and going into that crowd psychology you know there's a lot of kind of stigmatization let's say particularly from Jungians and stuff like that or people of that persuasion that crowd psychology and dissolving into that is is a terribly bad thing and all the rest of it but it's it, it's a bad thing in its place when it when, when it's in its wrong place crowd psychology is absolutely horrendous I mean like what was it the other year the storming of the capitol building right that was crowd psychology in its wrong place but there's times where you can indulge in it and it's not the uh not a bad thing at all it's actually a, a kind of generative positive experience of unity that that is that is interesting that's that's an experience to be had it's not an experience that is to be uh gained all the time or to be used as some sort of dopamine hit um, that covers or, or, or some sort of, let's say, hit of positivity or, or desire that covers any sort of your, your own individuality and your own, maybe let's say, your own individual issues. That's not good when you use it for that as a continual thing, just like it's not good to use anything uh, in that capacity where you're constantly seeking pleasure from it uh, just to cover up something that's deficient in yourself. And of course, that's what our society does at the moment. That's the, the general gist of our society is using all these different things, technology, um, you know, partying, alcohol or other drugs to kind of get away from ourselves. Because fundamentally, we've lost our connection with, with let's say, what the Indians might call um, Mother Earth or something like that. I suppose that's a bit more of a, um, uh, a modern day um colloquialism from let's say the original use of, of their language or the original terms that they would use but again it has complete um fitting within what we're talking about so um that's one of the reasons and then you you know abstract from that then lost the connection with uh, let's say a, a wider power a wider kind of spirit uh, and a and a wider understanding of of the universe and, and our place in the universe and things like that. And, and th these things all provide meaning, which then mean you don't need to indulge in all these things in, in excess. But nonetheless, uh, that's my little kind of, uh, let's say, intellectual uh, portion done for, for that, because I want to concentrate on the positive side of, of the experience as well. Um, so we did that on the, I don't know, second, third or second night, um, which was, which I, you know, as I say, once I got into it, I absolutely loved. Mm. Yeah, so I don't have my, uh, I don't have my glass uh, uh, cup today. So what I'll do is when I'm getting near the end, I'll just tell you when I'm getting near the end. So the next day we didn't have a beach, we didn't have a uh, pool day. We went right, we went to a beach, absolutely brilliant. We went to another little beach club there and went to a foam party and stuff. I put a picture of me covered in foam up there, which was quite fun. Um, and uh, again, remarkable vibe there. This beach was clear blue uh, seas, uh, lovely sort of like a a whitey type sand. You know, it was really that sort of colour. Um, and there was tons of people there again, you know, all young people, men, women, 
everyone in the swimming costumes and stuff it was a sight to behold it was like something off a movie you know absolutely brilliant uh and so we had a drink in that club and this was only mid-afternoon or something um and we uh uh we did the kind of you know this phone party and stuff so that was our kind of second clubbing experience and it happened to have been uh only a few hours later really because the previous night we'd been out uh, then we went back and we did our, you know, usual tea stuff, all that sort of stuff, and a bit of a chill out and stuff. And then we went clubbing again. We had actually met some girls at the hotel, so we, we went out clubbing with them. And uh, we had a great time there. We went to a Pirates-themed club, and uh, we got a big free bottle of sours or whatever it was, I don't know. But um, <coughs> it was quite it was quite cool. Um, and then we were drinking and dancing and I was on the pole, you know, I'm like, you literally see a pole, I'm going to get on the pole and do dancing on the pole and stuff. So I was doing that. And, uh, and then I was walking around and stuff, seeing if there was anyone I could scout out, you know, have a bit of a dance with, maybe do a bit of flirting with and stuff. Didn't really work out in my favour, but nonetheless, you know, sometimes these things don't. But you got to you got to try your shot, you know, you got to have your shot, you got to walk around and see what's what. So, uh, yeah, so that's what we did. And then, uh, oh, well, one of my friends got into a bit of bother and stuff. And uh, it, short and long of it was that he was sick. So we ended up going back. Um, this was about two, two o'clock or something. The other night we had stayed out till 4 a.m. Because you see the clubs there, bizarrely, don't really get going till about one or two. And don't really get busy until three. So it's like, you know, it's... it's uh, it's crazy, you have to stay out for a long time. Anyway, so this was, you know, we're on the third or fourth day now. Uh, this is the next day I'm coming to. You know, same sort of setup. I think we have a, have a kind of uh, pool day again this day, chilling and stuff. I'm always getting up early for breakfast. Uh, one of my friends wasn't really that bothered about getting up for breakfast. He'd rather have had a lie-in. I wanted to get up. I like to get up early, as you know. Um, I don't like to entertain this getting up at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. That, to me, seems bloody ridiculous. But OK, you know, if people want to do it, that's fair enough. And I do it from time to time, but I don't really like it. Um, so, yeah, so I get up for breakfast. That means, obviously, most of these nights I've only had about three, four hours sleep. So, you know, it's starting to affect me and stuff. But, I, you know, go for breakfast, have this little pool day thing. Nothing to tell, really, on that day. Next day, we... Uh, uh, we do go to another beach. I think it was this day we went to another beach called Konos Beach or Konos Bay. It's probably be better known as Konos Bay. Lovely little bay. There's some cliffs up here. You've got like a little walk down pathway here to the bay. Uh, not a very big bay particularly. Probably, I don't know, half a mile or something like that. You might, might be a mile at most, I would say. But um, yeah, so it's a little bay sun lounges on there we got some sun lounges of course sat there went in the sea we did a little bit of swimming in the sea on the first day and the second day in fact i think the other lads i was with they swam in the sea every day i did it about three or four times because to be honest i get a bit bored with it i'm like well we'll you know go in the sea today but then after a few days you're like mm, well, i'm not really that bothered it's the sea isn't it it's, it's great and everything but i'm not really i don't really want to get wet so uh i uh i you know i would say swimming it maybe three times or something so uh we were at this bay did about i had i was reading my book i was reading uh marie louise von franz the dreams book that i've wanted to read forever and never got a chance so i thought i'll bring that on holiday so i've basically completed that book now which is great you know over the whole over the course of the whole day uh really really good book actually there's some things in it that i don't really agree with but there's other bits that i really get on board with and stuff so it's really helpful um and we then, after the bay, because this was at like, I don't know, four or five o'clock, something like that. We we spent like a whole day there, you know, well, maybe from about 11 a.m. to, to four or five uh, when we were packing up. But we didn't go then. What we did was Ryan wanted to go to some cave thing, Cyclops Cave or something it was called. Again, I'll put some pictures up there of prob probably of me being ridiculous in the cave doing some weird pose. Um but yeah, so we went to that cave. I was expecting this grand cave, you know, with all sorts, with like a little weird mystical pool in the middle of it, you know, that, that glimmers and shines and all walls that are like uh, 
I don't know, uh, covered in kind of moisture and stuff, and it was a massive cave. You get that archetypal image of the cave, like, you know, the watery cave like, in your mind. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. And uh, it, it, it was just this tiny little cave that was... That actually had two entrance points, so it, it kind of looked like two eyes. So how the hell he called it Cyclops, Cyclops Cave? I don't even know about that, but anyway, um, there was a little kind of hole in the middle of it. So I'm guessing that was meant to be the eye of the Cyclops or something. I don't know, but it didn't really seem like the best name to to me. But there you go. People call these things these things for some reason. So yeah, so went there. Then uh, we went up. Uh, yeah, and then we just went back, I think. We, we, it was a little bit of a trek round to that. Then we went to the cave, then we went back. I don't think we went anywhere else on that particular day. Then we got a taxi, this was like 6, 7 o'clock or something. Back to the hotel, tea, etc. We just had a few drinks at the bar that night. I think the guys might have gone on somewhere else, but I can't remember exactly. But I ended up going back to the room. Um, and yeah, I don't think there was anything, anything else that day. Uh... Next day, a uh, bit more of a pool day, I believe. Uh, yeah, a bit more of a pool day. And uh, then, again, pretty standard day, food, etc. And then drinks at the bar. And that was, like, about it, really. And then uh, the last day, we went to the beach lounges on the beach. So the hotels here beaches here and then it go it extends quite away this beach and then we uh we sat there the girls happened to be uh sort of synchronously if you will uh we didn't know this but they had already bought two uh, sun loungers and it happened that we had bought two sun loungers directly opposite them about three meters away or something so that was really really weird so we met them there and we had we had been with the girls the, the girls that we met at the hotel by the way um like for three days or so you know at night time and stuff like that and sometimes in the day and we'd actually no actually i'm getting me somewhat wrong because one of those days mustn't have been a beach day because we went to this might have been the friday we went to uh, something that was meant to be called the Blue Lagoon. Again, I got this archetypal image of a Blue Lagoon, and I was like, all oh, excited, and so I was like, oh my god, it's going to be like this. I wasn't so excited, because actually I was quite tired at this point on the holiday, because we had done quite a lot. Don't forget as well, one of my friends is an extrovert, I'm an introvert, which is brilliant, because you've got the compensation. He's also a sensation type, and I'm an intuitive type, um, so that's brilliant as well, so you get your... You get your shadow work there. You can do a lot of shadow work in that situation because they're always expressing in their personality what you lack. So you can start to pick up on your shadow from that through their behaviour. So when, let's say, my friend is eating his meals or when he's he's looking uh, at the environment, he's doing it from a sensation viewpoint. I'm doing it from an intuitive viewpoint. My sensation is dulled. So if I look at his behaviour and I can see where his sensation lies in his language and in his uh, in his movements and his orientation and his behavior and also where that extroversion lies i can assimilate that consciously and then utilize that in my own behavior and then be sort of behaviorally reinforce it you see consciously the my ego can essentially take on um sort of like a, a psychic power from the environment but based on the assimilation of those different traits i'm seeing so that that's kind of it's kind of like a medium level you know uh, a beginner to intermediate level jungian kind of thinking that it's not necessarily really difficult jungian thinking but you slowly start to pick up on that uh, after after a few months of of reading jung and and you know learning about certain concepts and stuff and applying them to your own life and and being empirical with these things but it's certainly not really difficult stuff um so it was brilliant because it made me aware. I had, a, I had a little vision on holiday as well. I didn't have much dreams on holiday or anything like that, but I had a little vision on holiday, and uh, it was it really highlighted to me this this marriage with the the sensation function through my friend um, on on holiday, and and being able to pick up on that a bit more. And I did notice, you know, sort of that autonomous arising of the the inferior function coming up into my consciousness every now and then perhaps from a product of the environment perhaps from a product of increased awareness of it 
perhaps just because I was around sensation types a little bit more. Both my friends, in fact, are sensation types. Just one of my friends is an extrovert. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was really, really interesting. It was really generative for, for things like that. Um, but yeah, so we went to this Blue Lagoon thing and, uh, uh I was, you know, I expected this great thing and it wasn't necessarily, um, but we, uh, uh, we went there. I was just sat down. I was very tired. Um, I had expended, oh, uh, low battery here. Uh, I had expended most of my energy uh, on the holiday because this was like the last day or second to last day. Uh, I had no bloody extroversion left. I had no desire to do things left. I had, you know, I was, phew, I was very, uh, very gone, basically. I, I think I could have been, uh, shall we say, more zen uh, if I had applied myself more, if I'd really, you know, overcome myself and pushed my spirit forward uh but at the end of the day uh i had i had done some good things on the holiday um and the holiday itself was was there in a sense getting on the plane and doing the holiday was was a challenge for me so i was happy with what i had accomplished although of course the unconscious or even aspects of my own ego uh may have been uh, a little bit um annoyed or disappointed with the fact um maybe on those last couple of days i couldn't access that strength of spirit that that let's say that archetypal or typical zen master uh in the height of um i don't know some some level of great enlightenment would would muster um but nonetheless you know that that's uh by the by really you know and, and what what happened on the holiday was uh, really conducive for my personality and uh, I really enjoyed a lot of it as well so so yeah uh, that was that was basically the whole day there was a few things in there of course that, you know I've not gone into great detail but the photos that I'll have put up will have gone into a bit more detail and told you a little bit more about it and stuff and it would have been uh, that, that'll help elucidate what I'm trying to say and give you a little bit more meat on the bone shall we say of of what actually happened because there's things of course in there that that I've not touched upon and stuff. Um, but yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. I I'm glad to be back. Uh, I am getting on with work now. I'm trying to get back into it. I've only been back a few days. Um, but yeah, I am trying to get back into it. Uh, I have struggled with motivation, I would say the last four weeks-ish, something like that. Um, even before I went on holiday, I was struggling with it. So I'm trying to get back into it a bit more. I'm still getting up fairly early, about half six. Um, and I, I am trying to push through, but it is for some reason, I don't know why, and this is the case uh, uh, every now and then, because these things come in, in waves, shall we say, that, uh, you know, you, you can get this kind of lull of motivation and things just don't, you do need to kind of, Sometimes you just need to access something within you to push you through. It's not just a case of relaxing. You know, I've had some time to relax, not only on the whole day, but before the whole day, I was going a little bit easier on myself. And so now it's very much a case, well, it's not that I need to relax. It's more that I need to just muster something within me to get going again. The other thing I should mention just before we, we wrap up and I'll drink a bit more of this tea, actually. Um, is that I did try not to work on holiday. I took my laptop with me, but I did very, very little work. Uh, it was mainly um, that I was I was just doing what was what was there on the holiday, which is a great achievement for me because I am always I am absolutely in love with my work. There's uh, there is a brilliant saying, you know, when someone says they're married to their work. That's very much like I am. I absolutely love it, and uh, so, you know, of course, but of course, at the same time, it does give you a fatigue every now and then, even if you love your work, you know, you can only work 12-hour days so for so long, especially when you're doing it seven days a week, so, um, of course, there comes a point where you do get a little bit of fatigue, and uh, and you, you need a bit of a break, and you need to relax down a little bit, um, 
uh, but now I uh, I'm really inspired to get back to my work and I, I want to uh, reassess what I've got to do over summer organize myself a little bit more and then and then push myself back into it and and see what's what but I do have to be careful because um I can get very kind of uh into that mode of work and really be go for it uh and and sometimes that can be at the detriment to to other elements of my personality for example you know in this Jungian idea of wholeness of being this whole personality uh, doing something like work all the time um, can sometimes, if you if you don't attend to yourself and your consciousness, it can sometimes mean that certain other aspects of your personality, or let's say the psychological functions, are um, a little bit off within you, and it's you're a little bit too one sided. For example, it might be the case that you're too one sided uh, in the thinking aspect, in the introverted thinking aspect and maybe your feeling suffers a little bit. It might be the, the, the case that, let's say, a certain archetype is, is heavily within your consciousness, such as something like the wise old man archetype, um, and, and you're less, let's say, within your, your real sense or true sense of self. Um, and, and that is a very, very hard thing to get access to anyway, and it's not unfortunately this kind of sense of self or this kind of nugget of self is something that is very very hard to sustain like I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm in my true sense of self now this is more like just an aspect of my sense of self if I was in my true sense of self it's more the kind of like Adam that is exuberant like whoa you know you know all, all that and like he's crazy and this and that you know, and a little bit of it's coming through now and that's my that's that's the self that's the nugget that Jung talked about that's the um embryonic germplasm that Jung talked about that's the personality in there and with me that's the kind of the weird eccentric you know like almost childlike exuberance that comes out every now and then and you know that that is the genuine center of personality and that is aligned with both my unconscious self in an, in an instinctive way as it pushes through and then my conscious self as well in, in with regards to the personality and that is of course tied in its uh you know, kind of manifestation with the trickster archetype and it's tied to a specific uh, experience which relates to, you know, in, in the world of fiction, we can relate it to things like Willy Wonka or Mr. Megorium or Mary Poppins or the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland, those sorts of themes. That's, of course, an exaggerated manifestation of it in fiction, but it, it still holds true for, let's say, the personality in reality. Um, uh, and so, you know, when I'm chatting on these videos, I'm not necessarily fully within that, you know, complete nugget of, of, of uh, self, but nonetheless, I'm in an aspect of myself, an aspect of the personality that the conscious ego is integrated with, shall we say, or at least partially integrated with, because obviously you can't ever know how fully uh, your ego is, is integrated with that, because there's always an element of unconsciousness there. But you can say more or less that uh, if you've not got any major complex ties to that particular thing, um, then, uh, you know, maybe it's particular archetypal experience or maybe it's particular uh, set of objects or whatever. It can be any, any different things. But if you've not got any major complex tie to that, then, of course, you can say you're reasonably integrated with that particular experience. And therefore, you can say that, of course... Uh, um, uh, that experience is then in an integrated part of the ego, and while it isn't, let's say that that really uh, tiny, brilliant little point of of selfhood, shall we say, that's aligned with the unconscious and conscious, it is still a part of your personality that's being expressed in a particular way through the ego, and uh, it's perfectly uh, natural and healthy and. Uh, and aligned with homeostasis as well so long as it's not there's not a kind of like slightly fragmented part off you know for example that could be in the case of someone like a Jungian that could be a fragmented 
part of the trickster like that that would come in behind things and that's what comes in for me a lot of the time but also some of the time it depends on the general feeling within me but the trickster is prominently behind me all the time it's you know it's in there smiling away you know and stuff and and that's what people like steve richards have called the the trickster function which is quite an interesting concept actually um with regards to the diagram he uses to explain it and things like that it's very very interesting on a kind of like um i mean he calls it an ontological viewpoint and it is an ontological viewpoint but also from like uh well i suppose he does integrate this with psychodynamics anyway but i would more generally just call it a psychodynamic um uh thing you know i wouldn't bother using the word ontological in it necessarily maybe i would use the word empiri empirical in it from an empirical viewpoint or an observational viewpoint um but yeah certainly you know within that, that psychodynamic um uh element you know that really really works and that that idea of this trickster function is is very very prominent um so yeah anyway that's uh that was cyprus it was really really cool It was really, really cool. Uh, I enjoyed it massively. I am learning, though, as the years go on, that I am the most weird person going because I uh, am quite intellectual. I go clubbing. I'm, uh, I, I, I wear things like, you know, branded T-shirts and stuff, not necessarily, like, uh, shirts and all the rest of it. I, I don't really fit a... Um, a, a, a category you know what i mean i i, I write uh children's poetry with which which is really weird and rhymy and whimsical but yeah at the same time i've wrote all sorts of various other different poetry i like all these different subjects and i think to myself i, I don't think that I, I, as i've grown older what i've kind of done whether I've tried to do this or not, I don't know. Probably I have tried to do this consciously somewhat, but I've kind of turned myself into a person who doesn't fit a category or, or can't be compared to. It's just that I am becoming someone, and certainly by the time I'm 50 or something, I really will be this, that I, I don't have a, uh, a, a basis, an outer basis to be compared to completely. You could say, yes, well, there's a little bit of Dr. Zeus in me, or yes, there's a little bit of Jung in me, or yes, there's a little bit of Nietzsche in me, or maybe, uh, yes, there's a little bit of William Blake in me or something, or, you know, there's bits of different people in me and stuff. But, like, that isn't, that doesn't explain me. There are elements within me, and there, and, and I'm an element within certain other people as well if you see what i mean like i'm a small part of other people and other people are a small part of me and in the sense of not in the sense of their greatness or anything like that or uh you know anyone's particular like um legacy but more so in the the traits of their personality or or what they uh enjoyed you know the, the uh their kind of um career or the subjects that they enjoyed and stuff and uh, it's kind of weird because I can kind of start to see now how this kind of like individuation process starts to form itself through the years. And it's a very, very slow process, but you start to build up through your work and through your behavior and your action and all this sort of stuff. Um, this kind of framework of ideas that is differentiated uh, that, that of course comes from your personality is in, uh, and is in, inextricably linked with your personality but kind of differentiates itself from the environment and creates a specific uh, and again a specific archetypal experience of yourself that is differentiated or individuated um, as who you are and then you are known as that and if that individuality of yours and your work um sits on top of an archetype in my case the trickster archetype or we could say the the wise old man hyphen trickster archetype because that's my basis of, of my personality sits more on that shall we say um 
if that individuality is differentiated enough from, from the archetype to be unique, to be a unique idea, a personality idea, shall we say, because that's all your personality really is, aside from its neurobiological basis, of course, your personality is an idea and it's a very, very complex idea and it's a very, very structural idea, but that's what it is. If that's differentiated enough from the archetype, but not too much from the archetype to just like dissolve away, shall we say, then, uh, or, or to be just basically like, um, uh, you, you know, not really much of anything. But if it's like differentiated slightly, but it's still got a connection to it, and you are, let's say you become famous in your life, or let's say just after you're dead, then what happens is that that propagates itself in the mind of mankind or the collective brain of mankind, moving forward, uh, you know, cross-generationally, and then you become known as a unique individuality um, over hundreds and hundreds of years in society or even cross, uh, let's say, uh, even I was going to say even like cross-civilization because that could work, cross-civilizations. And uh, you are known as a particular individuality um, throughout those like thousands of years as that. How cool is that? And that that individuality is the thing that has autonomy in, and this goes back to the Western potential person, that has autonomy in the behavior of people for hundreds or thousands of years to come. And that autonomy makes itself known when, let's say, someone is talking or who is writing and who has a very strong connection to the work and is very familiar with the work and the personality of that person in the past. So that then what happens is when they're younger and their, their ego is a bit more kind of, let's say, fragile and not, not really, you know, cemented in individuality, uh, when they're talking to people or when they're writing, the spirit of that, that idea, that personality idea that's tied to an archetype of that particular person from hundreds of years ago comes through that person in their writing or in their behaviour and then is basically born anew in the behaviour of that person momentarily. And it's that done over the entire lifespan of a person through many, many different experiences and that individual bringing to the table their own individuality from their genetics, of course, and uh, all the other people that they have associations with that, that, of course, align with archetypes and all the just normal people in their personal life and everything, um, that then uh, cements, the, let's say, the coagulation or, or creates, helps create the coagulation of that particular individuality itself. And that's what's happening, you know, within me and within other people, particularly uh, when we think of people like Jung or we think of people like Peterson or we think about people like Nietzsche or we think about people like Dr. Zeus. All these people, are their behavioural patterns, let's say, of personality are propagating themselves within me, through me. And then, uh, of course, uh, my own individuality being being accounted for as well. And all this is like spinning round like a washing machine over time within my behaviour and within these things coming through my behaviour. And then it's slowly cementing me, or you could say in this analogy, drying the washing into a kind of, it, you'd have to say that the, in this analogy, it's a terrible analogy, but you'd have to say that the washing is then being coagulated together into one ball of, that would be then a kind of ball of various different colours of washing that creates one particular state. Kind of in a sense, like in quantum mechanics, in quantum superposition, where you've got like two different things, but they're actually one state, you know, kind of like that. Oh my God, that's pretty interesting, actually. I'd have to do more thinking about that. But anyway, nonetheless, um, that's that's kind of what it is. And then, you know, and then by the time you're like 50, or because you, Jung says like, well, individuation happens, you know, or starts to happen like 35, 40, or that's when you should turn over to... Uh, you know, uh, thinking about more of a spiritual idea. That's a nice idea, but it's not always the case that it happens like that. Of course, Jung would be, uh, was very, very aware that, that this is the case anyway. But he had this kind of nice idea that individuation is like this thing that happens at 
uh, at, you know, after 35, 40, but it doesn't work like that all the time. A lot of the time, people get individuated when they're 18 or they're 20 or they're 25 or something like that. Normally, and a lot of shamans will tell you this, where if you're a shaman, you'll get individuated. This might be to do with hydrate openness as well. It very likely is, and certain other aspects, like maybe uh, certain things to do with high IQ, um, stuff like that. And then they get individuated young and they have all these big dreams and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, and, and then they hone their spiritual practice and they, they get over their ego delusions and all that. And then by the time they're about 40, 50, they're a re the real grounded spiritual master, right? Like Yoda or whatever, you know. And that's why all the, the people in the tribe project onto the shaman this idea of the great man because... You know, the, the become that, and Yoda is a collective representation in film of that, of the shaman, you see, and that's all we've done, we've just extracted that out and put it in film, and everyone knows that. Um, but yeah, so um, that's what happens with them. Now, uh, there are many people as well, Jung is correct, that do go through life and then don't get individuated till slightly later on. Um, but I think that Jung should have put more uh, of a let's say, pronounced more the function of the psyche to individuate someone young. Um, he did say that he, he knew about many people in their 20s who became individuated, and then he said, but most of them died shortly after. Uh, now, you know, that might be the case for a lot of people, for, well, not for a lot of people, but for some people. But for a lot of people, that's not the case. For a lot of people, they get individuated in their 20s, and then they don't die afterwards, they live till like 60, 70, 80 or whatever, and they go on a full journey, a full lifelong spiritual journey, you know. So I think Jung should have emphasised that a little bit more, and, and maybe he did here and there, there might be uh, different parts of his writing that I've not read yet, but, you know, he talks about it more, it could be the case, but uh, I'm, I'm not doubting that, but... Um, certainly does emphasise to a good degree this kind of idea of being 35, 40 and then you, you turn to individuation and stuff. Now, that, that is very, very correct, in fact, with things like uh, unconscious individuation. Unconscious individuation uh, or natural individuation, as Jung called it, those two terms. I actually discovered this on my own without reading Jung, and then I read Jung, and then I realised, oh my God, I'm, I realised that, yeah, thank God you've said it, because I, I, I understood that. But um, yeah, so I actually created my own conception for it before I read Jung, and then I stripped back my own conception, because I thought, hang on a minute, I'm just being inanimous here uh, if I keep that conception, so I'll just uh, use Jung's conception, you know? Because there's no point, it's just basically the animus repeating or trying to get one up on Jung. So so that's a load of shit. Um, so yeah, so I originally called it mana, um, mana individuation because it's associated with the mana personality if you're looking people like that. But anyway, so Jung had said, uh, Jung had wrote this passage saying, but of course there are there's a the gist of it was basically that but of course there are those who uh don't attain conscious individuation but instead attain a, a state of unconscious or natural individuation but of course the the end uh, remains as dark as the beginning in most people that's basically the way he phrased it and uh uh, what he's saying there is he's saying that certain people over the lifespan, basically by the interaction with the external world, uh, attain integration with um, the different archetypes, with the anima, with the animus, with the shadow, with things like that within them, and they get a state of balance. And I've seen this in uh, my, my granddad, for one, particularly perhaps to a slightly lesser, lesser degree with my other granddad as well. Um, and... Uh, and of course, naturally, it should be the case that they're unconsciously individuated because I'm consciously individuated. And of course, we're, we're genetically linked. So they, of course, have a, a, an association with uh, openness or with certain uh, attitudes that have then led to me, that have then got me to finally, you know, over genetic heritage to, to conscious individuation. Whether my children, if I have them, get to conscious individuation, I don't know because I've had certain socialized factors that have that have meant that my life's been a bit more 
well, let's say shit. So therefore that's given me the crisis to be able to get to individuation younger. And of course, Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz have both talked about the fact that individuation starts with a crisis. And that is generally the case. Uh, I've not really met people who are individuated and I've met quite a lot of people. So it is individuation, I first thought was quite a well, I first thought it was quite a rare thing. Then I started to think maybe it's a bit more common than I think. And now I've gone back to thinking actually individuation or spiritual awakening or whatever is um, there can be also in one interpretation a distinction between individuation and spiritual awakening if you so want to make that distinction. But there is another interpretation but that you can basically make the argument that spiritual awakening and, and individuation are the same thing. Um, but yeah, so... I. Uh, I first thought it was rare, then I went to thinking it was a bit more common, then I was thinking it was rare, and now <coughs> now I kind of think it is a bit more rare. I don't know exactly, I'm tr I've been trying for so long to understand, like, maybe what the percentage of the population is individuated, you know, and stuff like that, but it's probably not many. I, w I would say it's, it's not many, like, really not many. Uh, and then you've got to consider, like, the... Uh, uh, the follow-on effect from that and the, the the levels that you can get past that, you know, just spirit, basic spiritual awakening is just one thing, you know, then past that you can start to get more consciousness of things and more consciousness of the flow of thought and more consciousness of uh, how thought can manifest itself and propagate itself in other, the behaviour of other people in the environment and stuff and all sorts of things like that. So, um, and, and can basically the thought that you have now about someone doing something uh, may very well come true in reality and the behaviour of another person in like an hour's time. That happens for me all the time, like literally like every day. So I'll think about something. On holiday it happens. So we were talking to a guy down at the bar, right, or my friends were, and this guy was, you know, a bit of a cocky young guy, you know, wanting to get in there with the girls or whatever. And, uh, you know, you got to love him for trying all this sort of stuff. So he was talking to us to kind of big himself up. Or that's what my friend Danny said afterwards. I wasn't really paying too much attention. I didn't really want to talk to this guy. So I didn't. I just sat there like looking at the bar like bugger this. So, um, you know, I, I don't have time for people like that. I'm not bothered, you know. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'll entertain it. So, uh they were talking to him, my friend Danny and, and Wayne, and then I was thinking, I w we were walked back to the room, it wasn't for long we were talking to him, walked back to the room, and then we were sat on the balcony for a bit, and, I, and a thought popped up within me, right, and it's, uh, and, uh, and this thought said, uh, oh, I wonder what uh, my friends think of that guy down at the bar, and then another thought immediately come up, because I'm, I've, I've looked into enough things now to, to have these thoughts pop up quite easily based on you know let's say my causal history and the, the way in which my my brain's uh you know interfaced with the knowledge it's it's received and stuff shall we say um so this thought popped up and said ah don't worry don't even ask them because in a second that thought will turn into words in my friend's mouth you know that was basically the general gist of the thought so then five seconds later or less than five seconds later my friend danny says Oh, that guy down at the bar, he was funny, wasn't he? He was a character. And then I thought, there we go. The thoughts turned into behaviour. And that's synchronous. That's a synch that is a real, genuine, synchronous experience. Nothing really gone on there causally, specifically, anything like that. Uh, and that is what Jung talks about as well when he says, um, for those who have eyes to see... Um, synchronicities happen all the time that's basically again the general gist of the quote and uh, you can get to an experience if you really work a lot with Jung's ideas and you work a lot with you know research and stuff and you have to research wide I'm talking you have to research zoology neurobiology psychology philosophy physics all these different things you have to research wide uh, and you have to know a good bit about certain things but once you really research why and really get a broad scope of what's going on in the world and stuff uh, from various different perspectives, then you can uh, really start to gain higher awareness of synchronicities and they can just happen all the time. And you're just like, 
you go out of your mind because they're just synchronicities all the bloody time and you're like and you can use this for the spiritual development of other people like uh, and this is you know of course the alchemical ideas of um when let's say someone has perfected the lapis in themselves they then have because they are the lapis a living embodiment of the, the lapis they can then um instigate or kind of like turn other things to gold because of course when let's say the alchemist was was creating the lapis one of the famed ideas or attributes of the lapis would be that that stone or really it was a powder or, or it could be ground down to a powder let's say that could then turn other things to gold now of course it, in this kind of analogy of uh, the psychological lapis the psychological uh, philosophical stone then um uh, that basically works in uh, the attaining of consciousness you know spiritual consciousness through let's say the crown chakra the crown chakra and the um the uh what's the other one crown chakra and the anarja chakra is it called i forget but the forehead one anyway um those two are relating to spiritual insight in in man a higher level of consciousness of course which can also be anal uh, analogized to um, certain things neurobiologically with regards to the neurobiological changes during spiritual awakening and stuff like that. Oh, I'm getting low battery again. I'll have to wrap this up soon. Um, and so, you know, the, and, and then, of course, increasing trait openness with spiritual awakening and stuff and, and also psychedelic trips and stuff. Uh, and that can all be explained scientifically or psychologically. Um, but, of course... The, the the ancient Indians and things like that in spiritual traditions call these call these things chakras and stuff and 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 while there are scientific correlates to these things you can call them either one uh, the root chakra in particular and Jung talks about the chakras being basically localizations of consciousness and then you can abstract from that well you know the root chakra is basically the uh, parasympathetic and synthetic nervous systems and if the root chakra is out of whack, then it basically means that there's a uh, an, uh, there's something uncontrollable there. There's a kind of irritability, and that basically basically relates to uh, when someone's quite argumentative or when someone's quite you know uh, uh, quite instinctively brash or or can kind of uh, get triggered quite easily. That's a malfunctioning root chakra, and it relates to the kind of uh, let's say, the linguistic expression or behavioural expression in its very, very micro form of, let's say, that particularly that symp sympathetic system of that increased alertness of the of the organism. Um, not, not necessarily so much the parasympathetic, although it does have its relation to the parasympathetic anyway, so that could come in. Um, so, yeah, and you can see this, you, you watch this on podcasts as well with people where they're getting a bit, I wait and stuff and and you can see it within them and their face goes a little bit red down here and they always have to snap back and you see that that root chakra as well and all of these kind of associations with uh you know the spinal cord and the uh, parasympathetic and synthetic nervous systems and things like this these all have the, their associations in in different ways with uh you know the snake and stuff like that and the snake and the, the lizard and all that sort of stuff as we know, is a very instinctive animal. And when you watch a, a snake bite a, a rat, it's a very sharp and instinctive movement. And that is, in a sense, related to this kind of very, very uh, eye weight and very uh, attacking motion of uh, when someone gets eye weight and wants to defend themselves like that. Mm. But of course, it's another way in the sense of it's defensive rather than, let's say, uh, aggressive like that but of course that's just simply another a, a different manifestation of a very very similar experience um so yeah so, th so there's all that so there's there's a lot you know there's a lot that goes into this you have to really learn and i sp spent a lot of time because i was always looking for that jungian i was always looking for that jungian who was going to save me who's going to help me who like i want that Jungian who knows about all these things, I I need that Jungian because, uh, you know, I'm not enough. I'm I can't do this on my own. I'm a little kid. I can't do this. I've not, 
I've not got it in me to do this. But then I realised after years of doing this, holy shit, I've become that guy that I needed all that time ago. And now I'm like, oh, I don't need that person anymore because it's, it seems, ironically, that I've uh, got somewhere that I, I, you know, that means I, I, I can be a bit more independent. You know, I'm like, ah, well, you know, I have the tools that I need to get on and screw everyone else. I don't need them. You know, I can just do my own way. I can, I can learn independently. I can do the things I need to do. I, you know, so it's, um, so it's good. But anyway, I probably left something out there because, you know, as I do, um, <coughs> surprised I've not coughed more actually on this video. Um, if I've left something out, I apologize, but I will have to go now because, the uh, phone is giving me, a, you know, one of these alerts, like 10% remaining or something. But no, so there's a lot that goes into it, and there's a lot of uh, different things. But certainly, uh, oh, that was it. That's what I was talking about, actually. I will just finish up on this. So um, with regards to this unconscious individuation or natural individuation, Jung does seem to be a bit more right particularly in that case and, and he isn't wrong you know I don't want to say he's wrong with this idea that individuation you know is a process that happens more in the you know the second part of life that kind of shall we say that autumn period of life if we're doing the the uh, spring summer autumn winter split uh, that, that some Jungians like to do over the path of life as well but speaking more generally the second part of life he isn't wrong there that does happen and that can be very much the case and it definitely is the case with unconscious individuation because we see when certainly when a man or a woman gets to about 30 35 40 their anima really starts to get in place a bit more and starts to become a bit more differentiated and even if they're not even ever going to attain conscious individuation or anything like that it does normally happen and then by the time we're about 55 or so, they are much more mellow. You know, particularly speaking of a man, they're much more mellow. Really nice integration with the animal a lot of the time, or, or certainly some of the time. Um, you know, because it doesn't happen for everyone. But, you know, for, I would even go to so say to it for a lot of people, you know, a lot of the time. Um, they, they do become much more mellow and nice and all the rest of it. And uh, and it's lovely to see, and I've seen it in many, many people I know, um, and, and it's really, really great, and they, they get it's just a great differentiation, shall we say. Um, and, you know, to what degree that comes from, you know, unconsciously or consciously over time, um, probably more unconsciously, to be honest, from arguments with their spouse and things like that, and then assimilating, again, I would say unconsciously, these kind of aspects of that those arguments and the way to be and the way of their own anima within their spouse and you know assimilating that unconsciously and, and that you know it's probably something along those lines and other things that happen in their life as well and just daily life and stuff and just integrates nicely it's nice and shadow as well and the shadow and things like that and of course with the shadow it's a bit more of a kind of like stepping up a bit more over time and then and then getting a bit more of that integration and stuff. And it's really, really nice. It's great. And you see it in people. And, and it's just, uh, it, it just is really, really wonderful. And again, that, as I say, that does normally happen a bit later on. But, you know, to emphasise this point of individuation as being a younger thing, which is correct. Individuation could be a younger thing. But you see, we also have to make the distinction, which I didn't do earlier, that individuation... Yes, it can happen in the sense of spiritual awakening at 18, 20, 22, 25, that sort of time period. But it should be noted that if it happens at that point, the psyche can, can be, as Jung said, so disoriented. That's what happened for me. The psyche can be, happen, be so disoriented, to, disoriented that, for one, you're probably going to get delusions of, uh, uh, delusions of grandeur, which I got. For two, you're going to probably not know who the hell you are for about three years, which is what I got. <laughs> you, you're probably uh, going to be completely overwhelmed by the dreams and by the, the you know, overbearing uh, hero journey that you're, you're going to be thrust upon. Number three or number four, which is what I got. You know, so, you know, it's like mental. But, um, 
So, and also for a fifth point as well, and probably one of the most important points, maybe aside from the ego delusions, which really do need to be taken into consideration, but as a fifth point, that isn't full individuation. That spiritual awakening in that interpretation that I mentioned of individuation that says that spiritual awakening and individuation aren't necessarily the same thing, that isn't full individuation. That's just spiritual awakening. And then individuation comes as a kind of very, very slow process as you integrate and you individuate into life. And then by the time you're about 50, 55, I know that Jung says 35 or 40. I think really it needs to be a bit older than that, you know, until you're fully there. 50, 55, then you're like, ah, you know, I'm in my place now. I am what I am. Uh, I'm, I'm integrated with the environment. And hopefully, if you're famous as well, then most people know you and you can individuate a, at a more collective level and more of a, uh, as a, a, as a wider substance, shall we say. And when I say substance, I mean a wider personality substance in the sense of, uh, the communication of that personality to uh, the wider collective as well. And, uh, and and again, that's not something that happens when you're 25, 30, 35, 40. It can begin at that time because there's many people who become famous and things at that time and many people who might become famous and might end up becoming spiritually awakened at some point as well. So it might start at that time but it doesn't end there. It normally it really sort of plateaus and you could say that plateau is cementing itself at 50, 55. Um, and then you can see the people in society like that who've cemented themselves like that, shall we say. And they express individuation uh, to a certain level depending on how many complexes they have left. Because there's certain people who can be individuated but they've still got slight bits of complexes there and you see it in the behavior and action and, and it drains a bit of their libido, their psychic energy. And uh, so it's a shame because they could have got one level higher. So there's all these levels of individuation. Um, but let's say supreme perfect enlightenment, of, as the Buddhists would have it, and going into, a, I mean, you could say, I mean, this is maybe slightly different, but going into a state of like Piri Nirvana or something, that won't happen until you're dead. And that can be analogized as well to the resting potential person, to your existence as um, a pure idea, a pure personality based idea, which is basically a complex as well as as Lillian uh, Frey Rohn has talked about, as Jung has talked about. Uh, oh, oh, no, was it? No, it wasn't Lillian Frey Rohn. It was uh, Anelia Yafoy uh, in her book, uh, Is Jung a Mystic? A book of essays. Jung's also talked about it, Marie-Louise on France has also talked about it, and it is a sort of personality idea complex, um, and, it's auto and it has some autonomy, and, uh, and that is the kind of, let's say, the representation that could be thought of as supreme perfect enlightenment, because it's that thing, that subtle body, as the alchemists would say, whether you look in Western alchemy or Eastern alchemy, uh, the, the Eastern alchemists call it, you know, the Chinese, I think, it, I think it is, call it the, the diamond body and stuff like that. Um, and of course, you know, the associations with the golden flower and stuff like that. Um, but that, you know, in a sense, and as well as other things as well, like just the general idea within the mind of people, in the Western potentials of the brain of, of different people who know that person or who uh, know about that person as you know cross generationally um it 's that that has uh, uh that that really is the attainment of uh the supreme great enlightenment because then there 's no body to distort uh, or to imperfect the the individuality there is only the individuality as an idea there as an autonomous idea, and so there is no body to, for you to be imperfect within because Every sage, no matter who they are, it doesn't matter, every sage who has ever lived, if they've lived in a body, there is some imperfection there. There is some level of a complex there within them. No matter how small, 
or no matter how large, there is always some complex there. There is no human on this earth, not even Jung or anyone like that, or Lao Tzu or anyone like that. There is no human on this earth who can get to this perfect state of sagacity, perfect state of being, um, while they are manifest. Jung still had certain complexes right till the end of his life, whether they were smaller or larger, of course, obviously at the end of his life a lot smaller, uh, but it was the case that, that that is as it is, because there are always what I call micro-complexes around, which can be tied to objects and things like that, that are rising uh, certain instincts within us in a negative manner, whether that's just momentary or whatever the case, um, but that that is how it is. And some people, unfortunately, die having many, many complexes. And Joe Wheelwright talked about this uh, uh, when he saw people die and, the, and he saw people go out screaming. Um, and it was probably because, or very, very likely because, uh, of the fact that they had too many complexes. And again, Joe Wheelwright expresses this as too many projections onto the external world. Um, uh, and again, there's there's a bit of discrepancy there between complexes and projections, but nonetheless, both can be included in this. Um, they had too many projections onto the external world and they couldn't let go of the world. Their spirit couldn't leave this world in peace. It was clinging too much. So so therefore, they go out screaming. So it's the, the task of everyone, really, to withdraw these projections, get get over their complexes by you know, mustering spirit within you onto the external world, uh, you know, to overcome things in the external world, so that then uh, you can die at rest and at peace and go out peacefully and you don't have that sense of compulsion or attachment to the external world. But of course, the Buddhist phrase in so many different ways and uh, all these, you know, different religions phrase in <coughs> various different ways and have various different conceptions for and and even to a degree the the idea of the hungry ghost comes into this to a degree um so so yeah but yeah so you've 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 really got to be it's really bloody t tough it's a horrible gig it's a horrible big gig and i'm just constantly trying to um keep my spiritual game going you know keep my kind of awareness going and keep trying to push through all of these issues that I've got and keep trying to move forward and, and see if I can't, uh, in a sense, see if I can't get to attain uh, a level of, of being uh, worthy of, of a Jedi master, in a sense, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of like, or, or a, a, a sagacious wizard like Gandalf or, or, um, uh, what's the other one? The Harry Potter, Dumbledore, things like that. That's just like, you know, but my own version of that, my own personal version of that, which is very, very different. But uh, yeah, so, and, and that's always intrigued me massively. And that's always been my motivation to like, you know, and you've got to be careful because the delusions of grandeur come into it. Like, you know, when you think about this wanting to be a Zen master or wanting to be this great sagacious uh person because then what happens is you can identify too strongly as many Jungians have said in the past with the shaman archetype or with that why even like as that bridges on to the wise old man archetype but you see you, you don't need to worry too much about that so long as you can retain a high level of consciousness around that when you're talking about these things and when you're expressing these things because it's fine to have certain desires, it's fine to have ambition, otherwise nothing would ever get done. But it's the way in which you interface with that, interact with that, and the, and how attached you are with that as well. Like, yes, for me, it would be great to, at the end of my life, let's say, be a representation of that. But it is what it is, you know, I know that for me, the greatest journey is becoming myself and a byproduct of coming, becoming myself might be, by happenstance or serendipitously, might be the fact that those projections of those 
kind of character, shall we say, of Gandalf or Dumbledore or Yoda and things like that end up naturally being projected onto me by younger people in the environment when I'm 65 or something in 2061. And then, of course, I can take on board those people as students and mentors and things like that. And we can have that particular uh, teacher-student relationship and stuff. And that'll be very, very generous and very, very healthy for me. And I'm sure I'll learn a lot from them, just as they'd learn a lot from me. And that's very, very valuable. So, it, you know, it's not an issue to have that, but you do have to, you know, to have that ambition to be this great Zen master or whatever. But you have to realise, for one, you're probably not going to get to be this great perfect Zen master. Probably not going to get to that point. For two, you've got to realise that you've got to always be in line with who you are, your individuality first, and not become inflated by it. And, and just for three generally hone your consciousness, keep your consciousness strong so that then, again, you're not slipping into any sort of, like, very, very strong level of identification because that identification or that kind of pressure in your mind, I don't really want to call it instinctive pressure. You might be right in calling it instinctive pressure, but that kind of just general uh, thing in your mind is always present, that shaman, that trickster, behind your mind is always present like you're wanting to come out and smile and you know that inflation and that this and that that um so and you can integrate with that function quite nicely and the, the only way you can really integrate that function is by aligning with that function as expressed in your own individuality for me that would be my kind of eccentricity and my little bit of a trick tricks the nature and stuff but aligned with who i am and it would be also um, kind of like playing the odd spiritual trick here and there as well, you know, and that would be very much aligned with who I am and in my nature and my individuality without getting inflated or deluded by the trickster function, you see. Now, that is a very... Now, I know the Jungians watching or any people who are very experienced watching will be thinking, wow, Adam... Now, that is something very, very hard to do because that's a very, 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 very fine line. And it is a very fine line. But if you look at your dreams for long enough, if you hone down, if you cultivate the subtle body in your dreams long enough and also cultivate that uh, relationship with that uh, uh, embryonic germplasm, that central point of individuality, then you can start to coagulate that into something that's healthy and that's within your individuality rather than kind of like a a split off or a fragment fragmented part of the trickster of a trickster function um that is actually unconscious and that is actually not very generative to your individuality but i will not reject the fact that it is very hard very very difficult so the phone decided just to cut off there just at the last few seconds i had literally run out of memory so um yeah I've, I've not got much of my tea left you can probably see well maybe you can't see them there but yeah i've got hardly any tea left so i'm going to just drink this and then we will finish so thanks very much for watching guys if you've made it this far uh, and i will see you in a shorter episode of 10 minute tea uh probably in a few days time uh, I didn't expect it to be quite as long, but of course we got onto some Jungian stuff and I was in my flow, so I thought, let's go for it. Let's let's really roll this and see where we can get to with this episode. Um, but yeah, so I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit about my trip to Cyprus and a little bit about the Jungian stuff as well. Uh, next week uh, or next time, I don't know what we'll do. If you've got any questions, as always, whack them down below and I will see you very soon. So there we go, tea is done, see you soon guys.